So today I'm talking about enabling marine science in, with marine autonomous platforms in remote offline environments. So if you've been to Owen's talk in the previous session, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of overlap, a little bit of context I need to set first. So if you want to switch off, I know it's straight after dinner, just, you know, five minutes. So who are we? National Oceanography Centre, um, obviously it does science between coast and deep ocean. And part of the, the NOC is the National Marine Equipment Pool. So this is hosted um, in the National Marine Facilities team within NOC and is a, a pool of equipment ranging from small sensors that you can get off the shelf and deploy over the side of a ship to uh, remote sensing platforms like you can see in this picture here to larger survey class vessels um, and then even ships. So this is funded by uh, various different projects, but it, it's not NOx equipment. So anyone in the marine science domain can uh, say, okay, I want to use some of these platforms and deploy them at sea. So a little bit of background about some of the platforms we can see in this picture. By platforms, I mean vehicles in, in this case. Um, sorry, terminology. In the foreground, we've got gliders. These are ultra high endurance, uh, several months at sea that control uh, how they navigate by changing their buoyancy. So very low power, it can go for several months uh, in some cases. These are commercial off the shelf systems. We have no control over the software that are on the platforms or the software that actually controls them. So there's a challenge in itself. In the middle ground, the larger submarines, they are built and developed in-house. So we go, we build everything from the mechanical and electrical aspect to the actual design, and then the software that controls the vehicle on board. So changing the actuators, that sort of thing, and the software on the top side. So one of the challenges of operating a fleet that size, we have, um, 40 of those gliders in the foreground I mentioned, and we have um, seven of the larger platforms. The, the primary challenge is we don't have enough operators to be able to sit in front of each one and pilot it remotely. Uh, when I'm talking remotely, the platform is deployed off of a ship or from shore, and then is operated via a satellite link in a traditional sense. So this is a over horizon um, operating mode, but we don't have enough staff to sit there and have one person controlling one platform somewhere in the world. So as part of an industrial strategy fund project, uh, which is funded by the National Environment Research Council, part of UKRI now, um, we were given a grant to work on an Oceaneers project called C2. So C2 stands for Command and Control. This is a web-based uh, system for monitoring and, as it says on the tin, commanding and controlling these platforms. At the moment, we have the uh, two glider models integrated and our built in house Autosub and Autosub 5. So, Autosub long range is a much higher endurance, more like a, uh, a glider type platform that we saw in that picture before. And then, Autosub 5 is a um, lower endurance but much higher power, so it can do uh, camera surveys, that kind of work of the, of the seafloor. As I mentioned, this is a web based GUI. So we looked at what sort of technology stack you wanted to go down at the start of the project and adopted the microservice architecture pattern. Um, so I think all in all, we're about 35 microservices, give or take, glancing over at Owen, who's, don't worry, uh, about sort of 30 microservices. And then we have a monorepo uh, for our uh, UI front ends. Our front ends are written in Vue.js, so JavaScript framework. On top of that, we also use Nuxt.js which sits on top of Vue. Um, and then on our backhand side, we are all Python using Python Flask, um, and our APIs are using the REST uh, model. We have an event bus using RabbitMQ, which communicates between microservices and server sent events to and from the uh, backends to the frontends. Our infrastructure is all in infrastructure as code. So we have a repository that defines which microservice lives on which uh, part of our infrastructure stack. Uh, but all of that is based off of a Kubernetes cluster, which because of our funding is hosted in-house by us on virtual machines. So if anyone's ever set up a Kubernetes cluster from scratch, you'll know our pain. Um, we don't have the opportunity to run things in the cloud just because of our funding model and how we would have to charge things back to individual projects and people. So that's very that's a challenge that we need to come across at some point. So as I mentioned, this is an online system for commanding and controlling platforms remotely over the horizon via a satellite link. 
So it's a website hosted in a cloud and our cloud is in our own IT's department. But as always, new requirements come along and this one was quite an exciting new requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, we were given the opportunity to deploy auto sub long range under the Fuates Palacio um, ice shelf. So this is part of a, a ITGC uh, project to find out the uh, sort of physics going on underneath weights, which is a huge glacier in, in Antarctica that will amount to several meters of sea rise if it, if it ever um, it is disrupted from its grounding line. So in order to operate in this highly offline environment and highly challenging environment, we needed to adapt our C2 system to command and control the auto sub long range platform. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, there's quite a lot of sea ice around where we are operating. So one of the challenges of a, a, re a remote offline system, uh, I'm sorry, a remote over horizon system is the being, being able to react quick enough. So with the satellite link, there's about a five minute delay between a message being sent and then received by a gateway and then shown up on our platform. And the data down that side of the world is not particularly uh, accurate with small icebergs. For a bit of context, or to sub long range is not the best at the moment at detecting ice when uh, looking upwards. So we had to uh, develop a way to talk acoustically via our uh, command and control software down to the vehicle through the water column. So the, um, yes, yeah, so you can see there's plenty of sea ice around. Uh, I was lucky enough to go on this cruise. I can tell you it's cold. <laughs> but we were given these requirements six months before we had to go and deploy this. This was a very large um, uh, project for us to do in the six months. So we thought, okay, we've already got this online system that can control these vehicles already. Can we take this web infrastructure and all of these web-based online um, microservices and front ends and make them offline? So that's the route we started going down and we came across some challenges pretty quickly. If anyone's ever worked with Node.js before, you'll know that Node's packages absolutely love the internet. You pull one thing down and the next thing you've got hundreds being pulled down at the same time. That's not okay. Um, the satellite coverage for internet, uh, like minus 90 is pretty bad. Uh, you can't even get a phone call out home. So um, CDNs and fonts, for example, you know, you, you go up to a website and you think, oh, the icon is loaded locally within, within the web page. Most of the time you'll be pulling from a CDN. So content delivery network. No Docker IO, I mentioned our infrastructure is all um, Docker based, so we couldn't pull down base images, for example. No networking or DNS, very challenging to go on a ship and understand their network. Um, and yeah, you can't resolve out to say 8.8.8.8. .8 Again, no package installations or updates, that includes um, OS updates and even the um, uh, yeah, packages that support the operating system. And no Googling or dot, dot, going, whatever takes your fancy. If you're stuck, you're stuck. There's, there's no chance of getting out there. No, no remote repositories and no map tiles. You saw on the previous image, um, the uh, UI is very map focused. So getting in data layers from multiple different sources. So after we overcome some of those challenges, we looked at what we would integrate. So we've got two different form factors of our C2 in a box project. So um, we've got a, a laptop for more shore-based and um, local versions of, of, of a deployment. And then we've got a rack mount for putting onto a, a, a ship's uh, core scientific computing rack. In terms of integrations with hardware, we've got an acoustic beacon. Um, not sure if anyone would have seen one of these before, but basically it's a giant speaker and at the other end is a giant microphone and they can talk to each other uh, through the water at ranges up to uh, six kilometers with this system. It's quite impressive. Um, if you've got a whale nearby, they're not too happy. Um, we have a Microsoft Graph, in, Graph implementation. So this is the API that sits on top of Microsoft Outlook and the 365 stack. So some of our messages get sent through uh, emails but obviously that's not appropriate for all deployments depending on how truly offline you are. So in that case, we have an Iridium modem that can bridge that gap between no ship internet and our own uh, sort of communication protocol using Ir Iridium uh, binary messages. All of our platforms also support talking over Wi-Fi. So we have a long range Wi-Fi antenna that gives us up to about two kilometers line of sight. 
which is quite impressive if you think you can't go into the room next door at home and your Wi-Fi drops out. And we also have uh, integrations with various data acquisition systems, so DASs. We have the OpenRV DAS, which is an open source ship-based data acquisition system for American ships, and the National Marine Facilities uh, Research Vessel dash, uh, DAS. Uh, in terms of integrations on C2 in a box, we don't have uh, the gliders integrated yet, but we do have the auto sub fleet and our two research vessels, the James Cook and the Discovery. So the infrastructure stack, what does this look like? I mentioned that our online system is all Kubernetes. We started off going down that route and quickly found that Kubernetes does not play particularly nicely on a single node. Yes, I know K3S exists, but when you're on a ship's network and you don't know what the the subnet range is on, on the ship. Changing IP addresses, static IP addresses on any sort of Kubernetes cluster just sends the system into an absolute fit. So we ended up um, creating our new uh, infrastructure stack based on um, our infrastructure's code production, so our online system, and converting that into Docker Compose via various different scripts. So our infrastructure's code uh, is imported as a submodule that has a bunch of uh, customized I.O. definitions, kind of like Helm charts for your uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster. We then apply some expedition configuration overlays. So they are overrides on top of our infrastructure as code um, repo. So if we want to run a different branch or if we need to set hardware addresses for different bits of kit, that then gets churned up in a Python code, a, a nice Python script. and eventually turned into a Docker Compose. That's then spooled up on the, on the laptop or the rack mount server. To get around some of the networking issues we have with DNS offline, we host PyHole. If anyone's ever used it, it's great. You should use it. Uh, gets rid of loads of adverts. And uh, WireGuard as well. So for some ships, we don't know what the network is and we don't know what the security policy is. So instead of exposing various different web endpoints to a particular uh, IP address, we can just open up um, a single port and VPN in using WireGuard. On that rack mount server, we also use Proxmox, which is a uh, open source hypervisor. And yeah, this is the output. So on our login screen and our uh, OAuth provider, we use Keyclights, we mentioned a few times so far. And we also use GeoServer. GeoServer is a offline um, mapping server for uploading tile layers or uh, geospatial data in GeoTIFFs. Um, but best bit is it can be hosted offline. Um, we include the fonts in our front ends and we also use Vodaxio. I don't know if anyone's used that before, but it's a offline self-hosted NPM repository. And then our backend APIs, uh, I'll come on to a little bit later, but we host our own Docker Hub, uh, Postgres and our own PIP cache. And this is the tracking UI. So this is a separate front end. Um, you can see in the middle of the screen, we've got the ship position. So this is a live ship position being sent every second from the ship's data acquisition system. We then process it and load it up on this map. In the background of the map, you can see some sea ice layers and quite how um, challenging the, the environment we were operating in. You can also see auto sub long range one is the dot at the bottom of the map. And the circle to the left of Autosub is the acoustic beacon on board. So you can see the, the position the vehicle thinks it's in versus the position the acoustics thinks it's in. On the right-hand side, we're getting live events over that event bus. And that's telling us the platform health and if it's okay to carry on its mission. And here it is in action. So as I said, I was lucky enough to go on this uh, expedition. Unfortunately, Kuwait's Glacier had really bad sea ice that year. So we ended up at Dotson which is the, the, the neighboring shelf. Um, but we did 40 kilometers inside the cavity between the seabed and the ice keel. So underneath the ice shelf, there's uh, a bit of sea in there. And we went in 40 kilometers, turned around and came back out. We did 180 kilometers total distance under ice during this expedition. Um, door to door is 102 days at home. But because of COVID, we had nearly four, uh, an entire month in quarantine on our own. Um, but we were able to do continuous upgrades. Whilst I was on that ship, we were developing in the field amongst the ice and pushing updates uh, to our system. As I mentioned, it, it, we only had six months to do this. So there's quite a lot of bug fixing in the field. And we also had acoustics Wi-Fi and Iridium integrated. 
The map on the uh, bottom right is the ship track, so where we sailed from and where we sailed to. On a later expedition, we then deployed multiple vehicles on the same expedition. So uh, Owen was lucky enough to be on this one, and this was based off of the Discovery. Um, so we've got two different types of auto sub and four or five different acoustic beacons. And then the picture on the bottom right is the uh, scientist looking very happy to see the uh, positions of the vehicle's subsurface showing up on our UI. Right. Okay, and then as I mentioned, we were uh, able to develop offline as well. So in our team, we use Gitflow, really like Gitflow. So this is a branching model to determine how you should name your branches and how it gets merged in and then released. So we continued this process whilst uh, on, on the ship. We self-hosted our own instance of GitLab and GitLab CI. Um, we also used a Docker, uh, two different Docker registry installations, one as a pull through cache and one as a standalone registry. So as I was pushing code to GitLab CI, the CI was then building images based off of base images from the pull through cache and then pushing it to its own registry. Um, I was then updating the infrastructure as code module and then pushing that to offline production, if you like, even though there's only a few of us using it. And our front ends were then pulling down from Fodaccio. So where do I see uh, Seat in a Box and C2 going in the future? Uh, there is a big drive to decarbonize the work we're doing, um, especially around the ships. The ships are not great for the environment. Marine diesel is not very good. Uh, so the idea eventually is to take the ships out of the loop and not uh, send up to 50 scientists on a cruise at a time. So instead, uh, my vision is, and I, I don't know if this will come true particularly at this point, uh, is to use the a box as a bridge from C2 at NOC to C2 on a ship. You can then have the scientists, instead of going on the, on the ship itself, can be at home looking at C2, commanding and controlling vehicles remotely via a link to the ship. So that takes out some of the people from being on the cruise. Um, and then eventually when the ships disappear, we can then start looking at um, better ways with surface vehicles, for example, acting as acoustic gateways between subsurface, taking that ship out and back to our, our system at NOC. We're also looking at pushing some of the data to the British Oceanographic Data Center this is a kind of child company that lives inside of NOC, uh, and they host all of the data that are generated um, during cruises and from these vehicles. We're then looking to push that data automatically as the data comes in, including data that's come in from Seat in a Box via a ship, and then converting that into community formats like NetCDF. Um, oh yeah, and we were also looking at integrations with third parties. I haven't mentioned, but we are starting to open source some of these parts. Um, there's some issues with IP around the place, but we are looking to open source the um, the stack that we've used to convert the customized IO um, infrastructure as code to Docker Compose. If anybody is interested in that, um, I've got some business cards, but we've also got an email address, so we can sign up for notifications, I guess. And, and that's all I've got. So thank you very much for your time. Right. I think the first one is, looks more like a comment. Uh, I highly recommend checking out Taylor's Linux, a dedicated minimalist Kubernetes OS with full air gapped offline support. So I guess the question is, have you considered that? Uh, so no, we haven't. Um, Owen works on the same project as well. So he's welcome to, to linger up here. But yes, so I hadn't actually heard of uh, Talos until uh, this conference. So that's very good. We, we will be having a look into it because it does sound interesting. Um, but no, we we had very limited time and learning something new was kind of not an option. Um, we, we went down the Kubernetes route uh, right up until the last month and realized that actually the infrastructure was was not appropriate for, for a single node mm -hmm. using uh, K3S. So, we, we ended up going down that route of converting our customized IO scripts into, into Stock Compose. Um, and, and that has worked well for us. And I think it is a valuable tool. Uh, there may be people that are looking for a slightly lighter stack and are happy with just Docker and Compose. 
Okay, the next question, this is all super impressive, and I agree. Did you take inspiration for the software stacks used from other remote vehicles projects, for instance, space? Uh, so we were looking at kind of competitor systems in the same domain. We haven't looked at uh, the, the work that by NASA or ESA are doing at the moment, but um, the, the gliders, for example, have their own command and control system. Um, which has, has come out a little bit later than than our C2 project, but we kind of take influence from each other. There, there's bits that we need to fill the gap for our scientists and for our engineers. Um, so yeah, we the when we started this project, we were pretty much the only ones doing it with um, multi-vehicle uh, uh, command and control. So and we, we kind of still are. So the the gliders software will only talk to gliders; they won't talk to our platforms. Uh, so the, this kind of fills the gap between the interoperability between various different systems. But. Okay, the next question is, how reliant is this methodology on internet connectivity? That is, how hard would it be to use on an air-gapped system? So um, so th there are two different systems at play here. So the C2 system, not C2 in a box, that's online and has pretty good availability. We don't, we don't have a percentage. Um, so that relies on on internet and being able to talk out to things like Microsoft Craft and, and 365. Um, the the system we use on the ship has been quite reliable. Um, there we were able to roll out bugs as well. So Owen was remote in Southampton sending me Git diffs and I was applying them in the field, which was quite impressive by email. Um, so glad to have got that done, but. Yes, I, I think we've learned a lot of lessons, and I don't think it'd be that difficult to to completely egg out the system. And finally, Sherman Lowe wants to know, you actually went out to see Antarctica and developed code on a ship. I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, one of the benefits of the job, yeah, is we, you know, we were talking earlier about, hey, uh, our benefits are going on expeditions like this. Um, mm. So uh, Owen has done three cruises, so far, I think I went to Costa Rica at the start of this year for a short cruise. Um, yeah. Oh, somebody squeezed in asking, but you want to be remote next time. Yes. I mean, so <laughs> <laughs> I, any opportunity to go anywhere on a ship, absolutely do it. Um, it it's quite an experience. Um, but yes, it's not the greenest thing in the world if you consider how many thousands of tons of fuel it took us to cross Straits mm. Passage. Um, yeah, ridiculous. Um, so anything that's better for the planet, thumbs up, but definitely go <laughs> if you get the opportunity. <laughs>